Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Savasa Glutton. I'm the Director of Research and Training here at the Dibble Institute, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to today's webinar, Result. Here we go. Results <laughs> from a recent investigation of Lodos. I'm just so excited to share these um, with these findings with each of you. So this will be by Dr. Scott Crapo. I'll be introducing him here shortly. But before we do, I want to go through some technical housekeeping kind of um, items. So if we can go to that next slide there. Uh, real quickly, if you are having a hard time hearing the presentation, check the volume on your computer. Uh, if that doesn't work, please exit the webinar and either log back in or opt to call in on your phone. That tends to solve the issue. We also want to take a quick moment to acknowledge anybody who may be new to our webinar series. So if you can, please take a second and locate that control panel and the little raise hand function in the control panel. And go ahead and click that um, to raise your hand if you are new to the Dibble Institute. So if this is your first time with us, we just want to kind of get an idea of, of how many people may be joining us for their first session. Right. Only, no pun intended, a handful of people. It looks like a lot of you are familiar with us. So welcome back to those of you who know us, and to those of you who are new to us, welcome to your first Civil Institute webinar. I want to point out that we do have a handout for this webinar. You can find that also in your control panel. And in that control panel, you're going to see a questions box. So we will be having you ask questions in the questions box. There'll be about 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A. Um, so please just kind of maybe hold those questions until we get closer to that point so that they they don't get lost in, in the mix, uh, but I'll be making sure to pay attention to that. So if you have tech issues too, you can write any questions in there and I will answer that for you. So let's go ahead and do a quick introduction to the Dibble Institute since there are a few of you who are new to us and maybe wondering how we got our name. On the slide here, you're gonna see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble. They are the founders of the Dibble Institute. Charlie did a lot of work with youth during his retirement, and he saw a lot of them having difficulties around their relationships um, or when their parents were having difficulties with their relationships, that it was impacting the youth that he was working with. So we had this brilliant idea to translate research into teaching tools that could then be made widely available. So while the Dibble Institute is not a direct service provider, we do develop research-based practices and make them available to individuals and organizations like many of you who have joined us today. Another bit of information about the Dibble Institute is that we are an independent nonprofit organization. Um, we say national, but we're kind of breaking, breaking beyond the 50 states. We do have clients in all 50 states though who are providing direct services. And last year, based on our estimates, um, we believe that our clients reached over 126,000 youth based on the materials they purchased. So we're very grateful to all of you who are here um, and maybe who aren't here currently, but are going to watch the recording that are doing this important work with young people. So thank you for doing the work that you do. Our work that we do is, is really guided by our mission. And our mission is to help young people successfully navigate their intimate relationships through important information. And this information is designed to help build their knowledge around relationship building and skills-based skills -based practices. And we know that when we're having these conversations and providing this information to youth, it pulls a lot of levers. So pregnancy prevention, dating violence prevention, mental health, job readiness, and, and so much more. So this really kind of informs the work that we do. And in addition to being driven by our mission, we're also driven by our values. The first one that should be no surprise considering what the topic of today's presentation is, that we believe in research. We are big believers in research. All of our programs are research-based and we continue to strive for evaluations on our program to determine and demonstrate their impact and their effectiveness. So that means we also make updates to our programs as we learn new information um, and, and as new research kind of comes to light. Another key value of ours is that we believe in safe, stable, and healthy and nurturing families of all different formations. And this is our goal for young people to eventually have these families of their own and be raised in, in these families. And lastly, we believe that relationship education is for everyone. All of us can improve our relationships and um, we make sure that our programs are reflective of that inclusivity. So that's a little bit about the Dibble Institute. 
but let's go ahead and turn it over in just a moment. I'm going to introduce Scott, um, but turn it over to why we are all here today, which is to hear from Dr. Scott Crapo um, about the research that he did on love notes. But about Scott, he received his PhD in human development and family studies from Utah State University. He is a theorist and methodologist who focuses on the complexities of family development and the improvement of relationship interventions across the course of family life. During his time at Utah State, he has evaluated multiple statewide, federally and state funded relationship education initiatives, developed multidimensional family development theory, which is a novel theoretical approach to the study of families. He's contributed to the source book of families and methodologies, co-authored the winner of NCFR's 2023 Ruben Hill Award for the best research article, and has helped to secure millions of dollars in funding. And if that's not enough, when he is not engaged in all of those things, keeping him very busy, he spends his spare time with his family and doing, and I'm not calling him this, this is his words, other nerdy things, such as playing Dungeons and Dragons and designing his own board games, which we've had lots of conversations about, and it's, it's pretty cool. So we'll save that for his next webinar that he does with us. So with that being said, I want to go ahead and turn it over to you, Dr. Scott Crippo, to um, tell us about your study. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I, uh, I appreciate it. There's nothing quite like a bio to make you feel big headed. I'm excited about today's findings. Um, it came about as the result of a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and a lot of work to be able to bring these to you. But I, I feel that they're really, really important and really fascinating. But then again, I love research. So here we go. Um, first, the obligatory statements. The study was supported by um, funding from the Office of Population Affairs and from the Dibble Institute. And I work at USU. What I'm presenting here does not represent any of those people. It represents my findings and my interpretations of the findings that we have found. I'm going to say findings a lot, so I apologize for that in advance. Before we jump into what the study tells us, I wanted to give you a little bit of background, um, help you understand where we're coming from and the context in which the study occurred. Like I said, I'm at Utah State University, and one of the initiatives that we do as a land-grant university is something called Healthy Relationships Utah. It is a statewide um, outreach where we teach relationship education to a wide variety of people in a wide variety of locations across the entire state. Um, we teach fathers in jails, we teach step families, we teach youth, we teach at-risk youth, we teach um, relationship courses, parenting courses, all sorts of things. We also hit youth in high schools across the entirety of the state. Um, it's a different curriculum that we do for most of them. As we were working on this and as we were watching a lot of the youth and a lot of the adults that would come in with relationship problems, we realized that we weren't hitting early enough. We weren't hitting wide enough. There were a lot of youth, a lot of teens who were having difficulties that wouldn't get caught until they got into an adult relationship and then we're trying to fix up the problem beforehand. So K, Dr. K. Bradford applied for a grant from uh, the Office of Population Affairs to do what we call the FAST project, Flourishing the Strong Teens. We wanted to reach those youth who were at higher risk, who would get overlooked, who fall through the cracks and weren't getting our general curriculum for the general high schools. Um, so we had targeted three, three different locations, uh, two of which are reported in this finding. So we went to mental health facilities and we went to alternative high schools. So mental health facilities, a lot of um, residential treatment centers, outpatient mental health um, counseling, those kinds of locations. Alternative high schools where students were failing out of the typical high school situation and had to find alternative pathways to education. And we focused particularly along the urban corridor of Utah. It's known as the Wasatch Front, named after the Wasatch Mountains that it lines up along. So it's a small section of Utah, but it's where about like 80% of our population lies. So we found that there were a lot of youth who were not able to receive the kinds of services that they needed so the point of our outreach was to teach them 
how to have successful, happy relationships. The Office of Population Affairs requires that the targeted, that the curriculum we use to target these youth be shown to be effective in improving sexual outcomes. So they have less, less risky behaviors and fewer pregnancies and STIs over time, which is awesome. Um, we looked through all of the various curriculum that were available to us, and we eventually settled on love notes because being a relationship education outreach initiative, we believe that the most effective way we can help youth reduce pregnancy and STI and make better decisions is to do it in the context of healthy relationships. However, we ran into some questions and complications as we went through this process. The first was that OPA required it to be successful with sexual behaviors, which is awesome. But what about actually improving relationships? That's what Love Notes was targeted to do, but all of the research we could find was emphasizing the sexual outcomes and the pregnancy behaviors. Instead, we were wondering if in addition to that, are we changing their lives? Are we helping them with their pacing, with their red flags? Fundamentally, we wanted to know, does Love Notes do, do wow, I can, I can conjugate correctly. Does Love Notes do what it says it does? With that in mind, I had a question that I wanted to do to get a sense of where where the uh, where you guys are coming from, what it is you are most interested in when you're running these programs. Um, so if you could, I'm actually not sure how this works. Oh, there it is. It appears. If you could answer this poll, I'd be really curious to see where you guys are coming from and what matters most to you in the programs and the youth you work with. That's pretty in line with how we feel too. In the end, it's important that we disrupt the cycle of teen pregnancy, that we help youth stay out of poverty and we help it, them to make decisions that are gonna benefit them in the long run. But when we run these programs, we recognize that sexual risk reduction is an outcome of healthy relationships. And if they can identify what a healthy behavior looks like and avoid unhealthy behaviors, it's just gonna be so much better for them. Hopefully, Love Notes does that, but we didn't know for sure. So that was the first major question that we had. We ran into an additional complication. Love Notes is done over the course of 13 lessons. And these lessons often take 45 minutes to an hour each. So it's a 13 hour investment to be able to present this curriculum. And a lot of, Alternative high schools and residential treatment centers and outpatient clinics, they didn't have that kind of time. They couldn't give us 13 hours to be able to teach the youth these important skills. So working closely with Dibble, Marlene Pearson, and OPA, we developed an adaptation of Love Notes that condensed it from 13 lessons down into nine lessons. Now on this next slide, it, there's an overview here. It's a lot to take in. We're not gonna go through all of this. The main point that I want you to see with this overview is that we took all 13 lessons and all of the primary content, learning objectives and learning activities were kept in there. We simply streamlined the presentation and the order of it to try and reduce how many hours it took to present the information. With that out of the way, we found that we were able to teach more youth. OPA wanted us, when we were able to teach the 13-hour lesson, to teach the 13-hour lesson as much as we could. But when we couldn't, we could then teach the nine-lesson version. So we had a few remaining questions that were really critical to us to understand. First, did our program and our use of love notes address other relationship non-sexually oriented outcomes? Two, did it work with contemporary youth in varied context? It was the youth 
from the research we could find were gathered from nearly a decade ago. And although on this side of being an adolescent, a decade is not very long, for adolescents, that's a lot of time and a lot of change can happen in their culture in that time. And third, and this is really critical to understanding our program, did the condensed version yield similar results to the 13 hour version? Now, we're doing this at Utah State University. We are an R1 Carnegie research institution. We believe in research, we love research. It's a very important part of our mission. However, we ran into some barriers. The first major barrier was that the grant we were given was for teaching and teaching only. We were not allowed to not teach somebody, thus no control groups. We weren't allowed to do what they call an impact evaluation, which really hampered our ability to truly understand what was being learned and what wasn't, what gains are being made. We would gather pre and post, and we'd gather on a variety of um, outcomes, which we're gonna see here later, but we weren't able to compare it to those who were not receiving the curriculum. And for those of you that are familiar with research methodology, that raises some major red flags as to how strongly you can conclude anything about what you have gained. Luckily for us though, at the beginning, early stages of inter in implementing our program, Dibble was also asking some very similar questions. And they wanted to know for love notes for students that were in school or similar situations, was it making an effect on non sexual outcomes? And they put out a request for proposals. So I had this brilliant idea that I would put in my proposal. And well, Dibble liked it. I basically said, hey, we're teaching. If we can gather some control data, we'll be able to answer these questions much, much better than we could before. So I wrote in a proposal, Dibble accepted it. And that is the background behind this study. Now let's get to the good stuff. Let's talk about the methodology, how we actually did the study, how we, how we went about answering these questions. First, we were already gathering data from our FAST project. It was important to us that we be, make data informed decisions, that we have a research base to everything we do in the decisions we make. We were getting a pre test, we were getting a post test, we were comparing measures. We then got additional funding from Dibble. We needed to be able to bridge the funding between both of these, even though they were technically two separate projects, and do it in a very rigorous manner. The biggest wrench is that we couldn't randomize. Anybody that was being served through the OPA funding could not be randomized. They had to receive it. No wait lists, no control groups. We were there to serve them the curriculum. Anybody that we were serving through the Dibble was specifically for control. So we ran into an issue that we couldn't randomize, forcing the study to be quasi-experimental at best. So we had to ask ourselves again, how to answer the questions? How could we find out the impact that we were having under these constraints? The first thing we decided is that we needed to keep the locations the same, the measures the same, and the procedures the same. We needed to have the control data mimic the experimental data or the intervention data as closely as possible. So we reached back out to our partners. And we said, hey, we've got this opportunity that we can more effectively measure the success and the impact of what we're doing by gathering data from those who are not actually receiving love notes. And unfortunately, we had several sites that were amiable and were willing to work with us. And uh, shout out to our facilitators who helped facilitate all of this process. It's one of those things as a researcher is it's often we get all the credit for the work we do, but really there's a lot of boots on the ground that make it happen. So we designed the process of gathering the control data to mimic the intervention as closely as possible, with the big difference that the people receiving the people with the students providing the control data wouldn't receive the intervention. They would just continue on as normal. There were a couple other considerations in our design that we had to take into account. As I mentioned before, there was no randomization. What this means, to summarize an entire semester of research methodology, is that there could be 
the possibility that the groups would have differences, fundamental differences in who was taking the courses, who was receiving the nine th lesson version, who was receiving the 13 lesson version, and who was in the control group might not be the exact same population. They might start, they might see better relationships, they might have different dispositions. There's a million different factors that could influence the outcome of the surveys. And normally in a true experimental process, we randomize who is in what condition, who's getting the nine lesson, who's in control, who's in the 13, in order to even out those differences so there'd be no differences. Unfortunately, that was not an option. So in our design, we had to consider the possibility that there would be differences in each of those groups. The other thing that we had to consider is the data is going to be really complex. Running a simple pre to post comparison would be biased because of the kind of data that we have. Um, the data is longitudinal, meaning it was across time. We would gather a pretest, we would do the intervention or not, depending on if they're the control group, which kind of intervention. And then after that, we would do a post test. So was, there was a cross time. It was also nested. I'll explain in a minute more of what nesting means, but it causes issues in the data. We had people that had multiple time points in those people, those in those individuals. Individuals were in shared classroom environments. Those classrooms were in shared um, location environments. All this to say, the decision on the analytic approach was crucial to being able to provide results that are reliable, unbiased, and actually answer the question. So we needed a way to analyze this that accounted for group differences, complex data, and additional confounds that could be obscuring or biasing our data. Fortunately, this method exists. We ran a time by group interaction in a nested structure using multi-level modeling. Now, if you read the advertisements for this webinar, I promised that it would be in an easy to understand manner. So we're gonna take a few minutes and my habit as a stats professor is going to come out and we're gonna talk for a minute about what that means. The reason I'm taking time to do this is because I want everyone who's listening to understand the results, to understand the implications of our analysis choice and the implications of our um, design choices because they influence and inform our interpretation of the data. So first I'm gonna talk about the multi-level modeling and nested data, nested data, what that is and what it means. So imagine you have a school. This is the prototypical example. You've got a school that you want to do a study in. Inside that school, there are multiple classrooms. Each of those classrooms is going to have its own culture, its own teacher, and its own set of students. As a result, any intervention that you provide in that classroom could differ from the inter same intervention provided in a different classroom. Not because the intervention differs, but because the classrooms differ and the culture and the teacher and the students and all that influences how that intervention is distributed and received. Furthermore, inside each of those classes, there's individuals and those individuals are maturing over time. They have life experiences. And the pre to post test is going to be driven by the individual experience, which is going to be influenced by their experience in the class, which is going to be in influenced by the larger experience of being in this centralized location, such as a school or a residential treatment center. This matters because it means that there's not what we call independence in the data. Normally, when we run a statistical test, the math behind it, the engine, so to speak, assumes that each piece of data is separate and distinct and not related to all the other pieces of data. But when you've got nested data like we have, where you've got people within time within people, people within classrooms, classrooms within locations, that, viol that, that assumption is violated. Like 
Joe's responses influence Jane's responses because they're both being taught by Mr. Strict Man, while um, Edward and Juliet's responses have a different classroom because they're being taught by um, Madame Polite. And that influences how they receive the curriculum and how they interact with each other in, during the class. And there's no independence anymore. So we introduce something called multi-level modeling. I'm going to keep this very simple. The answer is it's the solution. We explicitly include this complexity in the way that we model the data. So differences between individuals, differences between classes, differences between locations are included in the model and thus represented in the data. And all those biases that would introduce that would make our results be questionable are handled. We'll just leave it at that because, I mean, it's a full six months of lecture. If you really want to, I'd be happy to, but I don't think that's what you're here for. The next part of our analysis is what we call a time by group interaction. I'm going to break this into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about main effects and interaction effects. So we have a time effect and we have a group effect. What this means is that there is an effect that happens from pre to post. If we're studying, for example, ability to recognize healthy behaviors in a relationship, and we measure them at the pre, and we measure them at the post, the difference between pre and post is the effect of time. That, that's all there is to it. If we see an increase, a decrease stays the same, that's the effect of time. The next thing we're interested about is the effect of group. In this case, by group, I don't mean the classrooms. I mean the experimental group. So whether they were in the control group, the nine lesson adaptation, or the original 13 lesson version of the intervention. Being in one of those groups, we're assuming, is also going to have an effect. Is being in the 13 lesson group going to yield a larger increase compared to the no lesson group? We don't know. An interaction is when the outcome of one effect depends on the other. The easiest way that I can explain this is with an example from my own life. We're going to have three variables. My child's tone, how hungry I am, and the way that I respond. There is an effect that how hungry I am influences how I respond to my child. There's also an effect that my child's tone influences how I respond to my child. But there's also what's called an interaction effect, where the impact of how hungry I am is going to depend in large part on the tone the child takes. If I'm super hangry, but my child comes up to me and expresses very kindly and very politely something. The fact that I'm hangry only has a little bit of influence on how I respond. But if my child comes to me and has a terrible attitude and is being very rude in the way they talk to me and I'm super hangry, well, I'm a lot more likely to respond unpleasantly. Now you know that about me. I'm sorry to share that personal deep dark secret with you. But it's a beautiful example of an interaction. So the question we wanted to know, what we're answering with this particular analysis, is the fact that when they are in one, when they, let me try this again. Sorry. I started reading my slide and forgot what it was I was going to say. The analytic approach tells us two main pieces of information. First, it tells us how much they change from pre to post for each experimental condition while taking into account individual and location effects. It's really beautiful. It's, it's fantastic. I love it. If you have questions about that, yes, yeah, so let me explain. Let me get some examples. You might still be going like, what does that mean? I don't get it. If they're in the 13-hour, 13 13-lesson 13 version, 
they might have gained huge gains as opposed to being in the control group where they might have had zero gains whatsoever. The pre to post difference might be huge for one, but tiny for the other. Another example just might be in a classic um, classroom setting where I have two different classes, one where I teach curriculum A, one where I teach curriculum B. I teach my students from A to B. I teach my students from beginning to end of the semester and we see that there's a change over time for both of them. But depending on whether it was curriculum A or curriculum B, their outcomes may differ significantly. We've got one more topic to talk about in terms of methodology, and then we will jump into going through what we what we studied and the actual outcomes. I don't know if you guys have had this experience, but I have found sometimes that, say, the age of the child I'm working with changes how much they get out of the program. I have found that sometimes the temperature of the air makes a difference. I, I literally had this issue last semester where I was teaching in a class and the air conditioning stopped working. And so it was like 80 degrees in the classroom and the students got less out of it. So this is the question, what do we measure? There's many, 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 sorry. So the, there's this issue that there's a lot of different control variables. There's a lot of different things that can influence what it is the students might be getting out of the course. If they're coming to school hungry, they're gonna get less out of the course. A beautiful example of the reason we care about all these random pieces of information is that they can color our data. They can give us false information. The first example I want to um, share with this is an example that I like to share about ice cream and drowning. Did you know that when ice cream sales go up, the number of drownings go up as well? I think that we need to petition the US government to limit the sales of ice cream in order to prevent drowning. I think that's a really important move here. Obviously, that's why I like this example. Obviously, that's not the case. When we do statistics, we can do something called including a control variable. What it does is it looks at how the interrelation between the variables and it cleans up the mess. So for drowning and ice cream sales, the real predictor is actually the temperature outside. The, the hotter it is, the more likely people are to swim and thus the more likely they are to drown. If we include all three variables in our statistical procedures, what happens is it says, oh, drowning and temperature are so closely related that the ice cream sales are no longer associated with it. And we can see that the actual result isn't one. There is no relationship between ice cream sales and drowning. It clears away the interference. We call it something called control variables. So for this project, we included a handful of control variables. We talked about their, the age of the student because it ranged from 14 to 17 when there's a lot of difference in adolescence between 14 year olds and 17 year olds. Self-reported GPA, their self-identified race and ethnicity, their self-identified gender, the kind of facility we're at, whether it's an alternative high school or a mental health behavioral facility, and the time it took between pre and post because not every version of the intervention was given at the same amount of time between pre and post. Now, on to the good stuff. What outcomes did we look at in our study? Now, the difficulty that I ran into when designing the survey is there's a lot of things we can look at. There's a lot, a lot of different outcomes. We ended up putting it into two broad categories. We were curious about the primary category, the primary, what I'm calling primary outcomes. These are the ones that were explicitly targeted by the curriculum. These are the things that you tend to see as your program goals or in your logic models. Then there's the secondary outcomes. These are not explicitly targeted by love notes, but they might change anyway. I read one research looking at uh, relationship education that called them collateral benefits, uh, things such as well-being, um, focus, all sorts of things that come as a result of applying the relationship education skills, but aren't actually the target of the skills themselves. For this report, there were four primary outcomes we look at. 
The first is whether or not the students could identify that they had the skills necessary to sustain a successful, healthy relationship. The second is their ability to identify warning signs. The third, I called relationship decision making. Um, the vernacular for it, the common vernacular is decide, don't slide. Can they make decisions in their relationships that are paced and based on good information? And the last was just their own internal sense of confidence in being able to get, maintain, and have a relationship. The secondary outcomes were two sets of beliefs, one called growth beliefs, which is the idea that a relationship can grow over time, that challenges can be used to improve a relationship, and that setbacks are opportunities. The next set of beliefs are destiny beliefs. These are the beliefs that there's one and only. You find the one true person, and if you found them, you've done a good job, you have a happy relationship for the rest of forever. Research has found that growth beliefs lead to better relationships. Destiny beliefs tend to lead to poorer relationships. An important aspect of love notes is parental connection. They do trusted adult connection activities where they speak to trusted adults. They try to improve those as a way to help them balance their relationships. And last but not least is just their overall well-being. We know that relationships are tied into how well people do. And so we wanted to measure whether or not we were helping to improve their well-being. All right, now that I've bored you for a long time, let's get into the parts we really care about. First, who all was in the study? We had a total of 2,269 youth who participated in this study. Of them, 1,342 were in mental health facilities, 732 were in alternative high schools, and 195 were in Title I high schools and were identified as being at risk in those high schools. By group, we had nearly 1,200, we had 1,200, nearly 1,300 take the nine lesson format, 701 take the 13 lesson, and 302 in the control group. On the right side is a table that I'm not going to go through right now, but if you take a moment to look at it, it gives you a sense of how the demographics were broken up across these people. And here's our results. I'll take a moment to talk about what they mean for each one. We've got the blue dotted line, the green more dotted line, and the red solid line. I'm assuming those are the colors. I am colorblind, so even the fact, even though the fact I put this together, I'm not always certain which is which. The 13 dotted line, so we represent from pre to post, it says one to two on the bottom because I forgot to correct this particular graphic. The one is the pre-test, the two is the post-test. It shows us where their uh, starting scores were and their ending scores. A couple pieces of information I wanna point out here. Notice that the beginning scores were not the same across the groups. We did actually end up having group differences between the control group and the experimental groups because we could not randomize. However, because of the way we asked and answered the question, that's okay. Because what we're interested in here is the slope of the line. We want to know how much change was there from pre to post. And as we can see in this first one, we we're asking the question, do you have the needed skills to be able to have a successful relationship? From pre to post, in both the 13 and the nine lesson group, we can see that there was improvement. There was a large change from pre to post of gains. For the control group, there wasn't. There was almost no change. There was a slight negative that didn't matter, that we just feel is basically the same. They maintained, they did not change from pre to post. Over here on the right, I have the p-values, which is our way of asking, is there a real effect here? Are we confident that there's actually a difference? And we ask ourselves, did the 13 lesson differ from the controls? And the answer is yes. Did the nine lesson differ from the controls? Yes. Did the 13 lesson differ from the nine lesson version? And the answer is no, it did not. In terms of outcomes, using the nine lesson adaptation had just as successful outcomes as using the original 13 lesson version, both of which were superior in outcome to the control group. Next outcome. 
warning signs, we can see a very similar pattern here. Um, there was a slight increase for the control group that was not statistically significant, meaning that for all intents and purposes, it's a flat line. The 13 and the 9 lesson version both improved and didn't differ from each other. The 9 lesson version was just as successful from the 13 lesson version in helping students to identify warning signs. The next one. Decision making, their ability to decide rather than just sliding into things, their ability to actually make informed conscious decisions about each step in the relationship. Here we have a slightly different break from what we saw before. The 13 lesson version and the 9 lesson version both differed from the control group, which is fantastic. It means that in our program we saw that didn't matter which version they were in, they were making gains compared to the, those who weren't getting the, getting the intervention at all. However, the 13 lesson version and the 9 lesson version did differ from each other. And we can see by looking at the graphic here that the 13 lesson ver version saw greater gains than the 9 lesson version. And our last primary outcome is confidence, which followed the same pattern as the original two. We can see here that the there is again a slight negative slope on the control groups, that even though they started slightly higher than those in the intervention, they didn't make any gains. If nothing else, they slowly lost confidence over time. Those in the intervention, though, they saw increases, they improved in their confidence, and once again, the nine lesson adaptation was just as successful as the 13 lesson adaptation in, in seeing this difference. So those are the four primary outcomes. We saw that for each of them, the intervention was successful, and for the most part, there wasn't a huge difference between the 13 and the nine lesson version. Next up, secondary outcomes. This one was fascinating, and I love this slide because it highlights the critical importance of having a control group when doing intervention evaluation. Please note that the 13 lesson version and the nine lesson version here almost look like they are flat lines. When I ran this data without the control group, it looked like we were making no difference whatsoever in terms of affecting their growth beliefs. However, when we put the control data in there, we saw that this was not the case. Those who are receiving no intervention, we see a severe decline on their growth beliefs. They were losing the belief that they could make a difference. That, hard things could improve a relationship. Whereas those who took our course managed to maintain their beliefs. Next is destiny beliefs. In destiny beliefs, we once again see that there was a major, um, there were differences between groups to begin with. And here we get a different story. And this story is kind of confusing, so I'm gonna do my very best to make it clear. The 13 lesson group differed from the control group. We can see that, that the control group continued to drop in their destiny beliefs and believing that there was one and only. The 13 lesson, they sort of dropped, but not as much. And it differed. However, the nine lesson version, it didn't differ from the control group. And it didn't differ from the 13 lesson group. That's confusing. What this means is that we don't have empirical evidence that it actually was any different from the control group. At the same time, we don't have any empirical evidence that it actually differed from the 13 lesson group. It's somewhere in the middle, but there was enough variety in student responses that we're not confident in saying that it's actually different from either one. We don't know. We lack sufficient evidence. Next outcome. Parental connection. This is the one where we see the biggest difference overall. The 13 lesson group, we can see that yes, there was an increase in parental connection 
control group kind of flatline, nine lesson, sort of an increase. When we run it statistically, rather than just eyeballing it and trying to guess, what we see is that the 13 lesson version did differ from the control version. It also differed from the nine lesson version. It was, hands down, more successful. The nine lesson version did not differ from the control group, and it did differ from the 13, meaning there was no evidence that it actually made a difference. As far as we can tell, the nine lesson adaptation was not successful in parental connections, in increasing parental connection. However, the 13, original 13 lesson version was. One last outcome before I go over the implications of this in five minutes, because I'm long winded. Thank you for bearing with me. Here we see that in terms of well being, the control group had an increase in well-being, and I believe it was a statistically significant increase in well-being. They did they did improve. They did got better, um, probably because they were in institutions that were helping them. However, compared to those that received the Love Notes intervention, they did not improve nearly as much. The 13-lesson group, significantly different. The 9-lesson version was not significantly different. It was also not different from the control group either. So the nine lesson version again was in that middle space. We were not entirely certain. We know that there was enough variety that it's possible it wasn't actually any better than the control group and it was just randomness. But we don't know that it's actually necessarily worse than the 13 lesson version either. It's possible it was just as good as the 13 lesson, ver lesson version, but we can't actually say that because there might have been just enough randomness that we can't tell for sure. So what does this mean? I just dropped outcomes of eight different outcomes on you with varying levels of confidence in the effectiveness of the intervention. So let's walk through this one at a time. Here's the main takeaways. First, for primary outcomes, we made a positive difference. Teaching the Love Notes curriculum made a difference, period. And in the condensed version versus the 13 lesson version, for three of the four, there was no difference whatsoever. For one of them, there was a slight difference between the 13 and the nine lesson version, meaning that fundamentally and overall for the primary outcomes, the nine lesson version was nearly as successful as the 13 lesson version, and both were better than the control group. Secondary outcomes. This is not quite as clean. We have a lot more certainty about the 13 lesson version. In general, it did better. In general, it was, yeah, I want to say with almost all of them, it was successful at making a difference. We saw improvements on the secondary outcomes in all of those. For the nine lesson version, did it differ from the control? Maybe, maybe not. Did it differ from the 13 lesson version though? Maybe, maybe not. We don't have enough evidence either way to say for certain that it actually made a difference. So the conservative approach is to state that for all we know, it was just random chance that we happened to get better findings. It might not actually be any better than the control version. One of the main takeaways I got from this is the clear presence of need. The youth need this, especially the youth in these contexts. Um, this, this finding here, I think, highlights it really well. As I said before, destiny beliefs are the beliefs that, not destiny, growth beliefs. Growth beliefs are the idea that relationships can improve over time, and that challenges can be used as a way to bolster our relationships. Youth who are not receiving the Love Notes curriculum, who weren't receiving our intervention, tanked. They, their, their beliefs dropped over time. To me, that signals they're giving up hope. They don't honestly believe that a rough relationship can get better, that if there's a hard time in the relationship that it can repair from it, unless they received the intervention. And another major takeaway is that some intervention was better than none. 
like the end, it doesn't matter if it was the nine lesson or the 13 lesson, some intervention was better than no intervention. Some context. These youth were already in services, especially those that were in like residential treatment centers. They were already receiving therapy. They were already in groups, in group uh, therapy. Those at the um, independent, at the um, alternative high schools, they tended to have more support services than those in traditional high schools. So sometimes we saw that the control group had gains. These services were making a difference, but they were not as effective as when we also included love notes as part of what they were receiving. So I'm over time, but I've got just two more slides. We'll make it through. It raises the question, what should we implement? What should you implement? Should you adopt love notes? Should you adopt the 13, um, the 13, traditional 13, should you try and do your own adaptation for nine lessons? And it's not an easy thing to answer. It depends on what the priorities of your, your program are, what the goals you have for the youth, what the needs are for the locations you're teaching and for your own program, for the youth you're teaching, for your, for your community and any constraints you're dealing with. So I'd like to ask a question for you guys real fast. Given the findings, for you, is it worthwhile to implement the nine lesson format, given that it has fewer collateral benefits. Wow, so many of you are in similar boat that we were in. Yes, it's difficult to administer the relationship education that we need to in the time that we have. This is our main takeaway that we took for our program, is that due to time constraints, it is still worth administering, and especially since those primary outcomes, we saw those differences. There were some of you, though, that felt the 13 lesson is still more important, and I totally respect that. It's going to depend entirely on you and your program, but I hope that the findings I presented today can help you to make a more informed decision about what's going to be best for the youth you're trying to reach. All that said, I do need to point out some of the limitations to the study. Like any good researcher, I recognize that research is not infallible, and it must always be interpreted as the context of what was actually done. First, we have untested confounds. Um, because this was not truly randomized and not every aspect of it was randomized, there are aspects maybe influencing our outcomes that are above and beyond what we saw here. We want to say, and Dibble really wants me to say, that the findings are due to the Love Notes course, but it is possible that there are other things that may be making the difference. For example, facilitator quality. The facilitators in our program are all 110%. They are fantastic, every single one of them. As a result, I couldn't include a variable that was facilitator quality low to poor, low to high, to see if it made a difference, because we didn't have any that were low. They were all high. Do they improve because love notes, or do they improve because our facilitators gave them a sense of feeling like someone cared about them? I don't know. I can't answer that. I didn't have it as a variable, unfortunately. Two, we didn't measure any sexual behavior outcomes. That's one of the strengths, but it's also one of the limitations. If you want to use the nine lesson format, I cannot guarantee that you will see the same outcomes for sexual behaviors like was tested with the 13 lesson format because I didn't ask those questions. Additionally, this was done in a single state. We did have quite a bit of diversity in our youth. Um, I believe it was less than 50% were non-Hispanic white. We had large LGBTQ populations. That said, I can't generalize outside of the youth that we used. And the last I've touched on this a couple of times, it was a quasi-experimental study. The methodology that we used accounts for that very strongly, but no statistical method can perfectly account for design flaws. And that's what I have. Thank you for listening to me ramble about my research. I'm happy to answer any questions that may come. That's me. I was muted. Um, I loved your everything. I think we're going to have you 
you know, teach a stats course. I loved your example on being hangry. I think it's something we can all relate to and, and understand. Um, I do want to take a quick second because we do have some time. Um, a question about the time period between pre and post test. Can you give a little information on the, the time kind of between those two? Yes, we had a large range. It would go anywhere from one and a half weeks to three months, depending on the site we were at. So if we were teaching the 13 lesson, 13 lesson version at a site that would allow us to meet once a week, it would take 13 weeks. If we were teaching a nine lesson version that had us com coming every day for an hour and a half, we condense it into about a week. And that's why I included that as a statistical control because the variability that was due to the amount of variation in uh, pre to post was accounted for in the statistical analysis as rendering the results as if they were all on the same length of time. Thank you. Another um, great presentation and congratulations. Very excited about your presentation here. Um, one thing was how some of the um, constructs and the outcomes that you were highlighting, how those were, you know, kind of measured. So, you know, we have the paper in here and I know you're working on something in that, you know, in your spare time that you have. Um, is there a little bit more explanation in the paper on kind of exactly what those mean, those outcomes? I believe so. Most of them were, let's see, we, we have, I'd have to go back through and remember what I wrote up for you guys. Um, I think needs, they are in the paper, and I think you gave maybe, and, yeah. and definitely citations for. Any yes, there's a, most, most of them came from, uh, most of the primary outcomes came from Venom and Fincham's uh, measure on relationship pacing and relationship confidence. The uh, confidence, whether or not they feel that they have the confidence, I believe was a single item measure that was original to this particular study. Um, growth beliefs and destiny beliefs, they were measured using uh, knee et al's measures. They were the ones who came up with the original constructs. Uh, parental connection was measured using um, I'm blanking on blanking on the details on that now. The well-being was with who five well-being measures, so they're 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 in there, and the details should be in the handout that was included, including okay. things like Cronbox Alpha and all that information. If not, we've got your email address. So. Yes, <laughs> and I'm happy to provide more information. Um, I believe very strongly in psychometrics, so. And I think this one, so it's, it's got. I know the answer to this one, but this maybe something that needs to be in the works. We'll talk with Aaron. I don't know if he's on here, and and Marlene, but. Um, someone asked if a love notes board game is in the works. So maybe that's your next board game <laughs> once you get this one. <laughs> it is not currently. Um, but you know, I'm open to discussing the possibility. <laughs> so there's always a possibility. Um, there are like two more questions. I don't know because we're right on the cusp of time. Um, I think we can get maybe this one. What control group activity? Um, so what did the control group? Do or get. The control or... groups engaged in whatever it was that they would have done at that location anyway. So if they were in an alternative high school, their activity would have been something as simple as continuing on with the lessons in life skills or history or whatever class they were in. If they were in a um, residential treatment center, it would have been whatever treatments they were receiving there, such as therapy or group. Thank you. All right, and that brings us to just enough time for me to thank you, Scott, for your time, your knowledge, and your ability to take something that can be very complicated and confusing and making it, um, you know, very tangible and easy for, for folks to digest and, and understand and just showing kind of the benefits that are still there when, an, when a program is, is abbreviated for, like you noted, all the different challenges that folks may be facing as it comes to time. So thank you for that. And thank you everybody for joining us today. There is a brief survey after this webinar. So please make sure to complete that. It shouldn't take you more than probably a minute or two. Uh, the webinar will be available in three days. You can find that on our website. If you've got additional questions for us, you can either note that in the survey or email us at relationshipskills at dibbleinstitute.org. Somebody else wants the board game, Scott. So I'm seeing a demand here.
Uh, as for our next webinar, we're switching it up a little bit. It is going to be on a Tuesday next month. So join us Tuesday, September 10th um, to look at lopsided love, asymmetrical commitment in romantic relationships. So we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you again, Scott, and we hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you.